I, I'm delighted to have been asked to speak to such an august institution, which has always been affectionately known in the McAvoy household anyway, not as the KAS, but always as the Archie. So just a few caveats before I get started. Um, the National Archives has been closed on and off during the last year in keeping with many other organisations and in tandem with the lockdowns. And I've been back in the office just once since last March. So I've had very little opportunity to take new photos of some of the records, which I'll be discussing in my presentation. Uh, therefore, please don't expect to be able to read the writing on all of these record images. Uh, they're included to give you a taste of what they look like and what you can expect to see the next time you visit us in Bishop Street. As regards an outline for tonight's presentation, I'm just going to start screen sharing now. So I hope you can all see that okay. We can, we can indeed, um, yeah. That's great. So in terms, as I mentioned about the presentation outline, I will run through the history and holdings of the National Archives. A, I'll discuss sources for researching family and local history in Kilkenny, and then we we'll wind up with, with Q&A at the end. So I would ask perhaps that you keep your questions until the, uh, the, the end of the talk, please. Um, so for those of you who have been to the National Archives before, or equally those who haven't, um, our mission and our vision are very similar to uh, those of archives around the world, uh, to collect, manage and preserve the public record um, and to ensure its availability as a resource and to safeguard citizens' rights. Um, we, uh, as our vision, have to ensure the future of the public record and to contribute in a very meaningful and concrete way to the culture, life and memory of Irish society. In terms of the history of the National Archives, I have it done as NAI for short throughout the, the presentation. But we are, uh, in a sense, uh, the, 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 the child of two predecessor institutions, the State Paper Office of Ireland, which was established in 1702 and was based in Dublin Castle. And it preserved the records of the offices of the British administration in Ireland. And the Public Record Office of Ireland, uh, established in 1867, to preserve the legal, record, legal records and those of bodies no longer in existence. So there on the left-hand side, you've got a, the record tower in Dublin Castle, a, which was the location a, an, of the State Paper Office. And then on the right-hand side, you have got what was a, known as the Treasury Building within the Four Courts Complex which was the home of the, uh, the Public Record Office, as I mentioned, established in 1867. So on the left-hand side, it's a lovely photograph, I often think, of the interior of the building here on the right-hand side. So uh, you can see these beautiful tall arch with arches and windows, and then you see it again here on the left-hand side where you had a beautiful glass roof over the part of the public record office that was known as the Treasury Building. It often reminds me of a cross between Kilmainham Jail and um, a Stevens Green Shopping Centre. And you see the uh, clerical officers leaning over uh, the, um, the, the, the banisters really, or the railings uh, within the public record office. And then fast forward to about five years later on the right hand side, you have the destruction of the four courts and within it most of the public record office and in the process destroying much of Ireland's early 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 modern and certainly medieval records. This is what it looks like after the 30th of June after the bombardments started you can see almost the, the front of a car actually in the middle of that photograph. So those beautiful tall windows and girders have been twisted and blown to pieces. And on the right hand side, you have a gentleman called Mr. Tucker, who was the chief foreman in the public record office and actually lived on the premises. Um, so for many years, we thought it was Herbert Wood, the, uh, the keeper of the records, but we now think it's um, Mr. Tucker. And you can see he's just looking at the remnants <clears throat> of this catastrophe 
around him. Uh, pieces of the records were blown uh, across Dublin as far out as Dunleary. Um, and an appeal was actually made in the papers to the people of Dublin to bring in whatever remnants and pieces of documents that they could find. Uh, such was the absolutely ginormous hole that was blown by ourselves into our own documentary heritage. So after 1922, attempts are made both physically to rebuild the public record office and also attempts are made to collect or replace the documents that have been lost. So some work is, is made and some progress is made in, in, that, in that regard. But obviously there was never going to be a full substitute for the records that have been destroyed. So both the public record office and the state paper office continue to function separately, but they lacked a mandate to collect the records of the new government with the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922. So from 22 to 86, so a period of 64 years, you have government departments hanging on to their records because the public record office is not mandated to acquire them. Uh, until, I'll go back to that in a second, the National Archives Act of 1986, which abolishes the two older archival repositories and transfers their holdings to a new organization, to the newly created National Archives, which is legally mandated to acquire the records of state, to destroy the record, particular records, but that's only with the permission of the director, and also to manage the transfer of records from government departments when they become 30 years old. Now the 1986 Act mandates a 30 year waiting period, but an amendment to the Act in 2018 has now shortened that to 20. So um, we will be acquiring records from now on, hopefully with a larger complement of staff to also acquire records when they become 20 years old with a view to catching up with what has been done with the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland and the National Archives in London, both of which have been acquiring records for the last 20 years. So we have a little bit of catching up to do. But there on the left hand side is our uh, the interior of our reading room. The middle is our quite shiny and swanky storage with mobile shelving. And then on the right hand side is the exterior sign for the building. So for those of you who visited us before, these pictures should look, uh, should look somewhat familiar. So in terms of the holdings of the former SPO, State Paper Office and Public Record Office, um, we have the legacy body of records or corpus of records from those organisations. We have departmental records from the foundation of the state in 22. We have, of course, genealogy records, and we have private archives, which were donated by uh, private individuals. In terms of the format of the records that we hold, the majority of them are paper-based. So paper-based files, registers, maps, plans, drawings, photographs have a, have a paper base. We have microfilms and microforms, which were considered you know, quite uh, revolutionary technology when they uh, came into use in archives and libraries from the 30s and 40s onwards. We have very little in the line of audiovisual material, mainly because we lack the correct or proper storage conditions which are required to store uh, film and sound recordings in environmentally friendly conditions. We also lack the hardware to be able to play them. So for example, if you come across a, a roll of film or a sound recording and you approach the National Archives with it, if you're being suitably civic minded, chances are we will redirect you to either RTE or to the Irish Film Archive, a, both repositories holding and the exact a, environmental conditions with which to store the documents and also the hardware and software to be able to view them. So here's just a sample of the, the records that we, we hold in the National Archives. I've deliberately chosen some colourful ones, mainly because the vast majority of, uh, of our records, of the administrative records really, a, have quite a, a dry appearance. Uh, so sometimes 
first impressions um, need to be uh, put outside the door because sometimes a document that doesn't look particularly interesting, uh, when you start to read it, it can actually turn out to be a gold mine. So there on the top left hand corner, I'll just run through these quickly, is the photograph of the first uh, Irish delegation to the League of Nations, to Geneva in April 1923, when the Irish Free State was formally a welcomed and accepted as a member of the, the, the League of Nations. So in the middle, sitting around the table, you've got W.T. Cosgrave, who was the president of the Executive Council, or Kishuk, as a, would the name would a, become in the um, 1937 Constitution, and Lord McNeil on the right hand side. Um, in the middle, uh, I know it's a little bit too small to see, but it is the 1901 census of Michael Collins and his family down in Woodfield, uh, where Michael is um, just 10 years old, born in October um, 1890, and turns, uh, turns 11 that year. Bottom left-hand corner is a booklet that was brought out uh, in advance of the mother and child scheme, which, of course, as you know, never actually was implemented. But uh, to look through the, the, the document, the booklet itself, it's very, very interesting. And um, because really it was introducing what would have been a revolutionary a uh, health system, healthcare system for, for mothers, uh, for pre and postnatal uh, care of, of babies. And you can see it's quite an idealized view of Irish motherhood with the um, Bridget's Cross <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the background. Uh, and of course, as we know, that did not come into being due to a combination of um, intervention by by church, by the the Catholic and the Church of Ireland churches, and also uh, politicians within the uh, government, uh, the government party of the time. Um, we have a number of health hints posters which date from the nineteen fifties but could actually have only been printed a year ago because the hygiene that they uh, abjure uh, or ask people to, um, to abide by is exactly the same as the, se as the set of conditions and restrictions that we have been living under since uh, the pandemic broke out in Ireland in uh, March last year. So proper hygiene when it comes to um, sneezing, don't spit, a cover your face properly when you sneeze, use a hanky and so on. They're concerned, of course, about preventing the spread of TB, which was ravaging Irish society, particularly in the 40s and 50s. Um, the middle document there is from Harrods, uh, and it relates to an invoice for uh, supplies of basically party items for the Irish delegation, which was negotiating the Anglo-Irish Treaty with the British government in uh, October to December 1921. And I'll come back to the treaty a little bit later. In the bottom right hand corner of the screen there, you will see the famous signatures, the signatories page of the, um, the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Back to the issue of health, that we've got worms in children. Uh, I quite like that uh, little booklet because you have this lovely picture of two little girls playing and then the, uh, the somewhat draconian worms in children. Uh, who knew what was growing inside your child's stomach? Um, the diet drink document there comes from a wonderful book of recipes from the 18th century, which was compiled by the nieces of Archbishop Twig of Limerick. A, and it contains recipes, cures, remedies, all manner of top tips of 18th century good sense. And this is from a diet drink, which were you to be able to lay your hands on the ingredients, sounds absolutely disgusting. Um, farmers no imported food poster in 1941. This, of course, is into the second year of the Second World War. Uh, which was um, known in Ireland at the time somewhat quaintly as the emergency. And farmers were, of course, being encouraged to grow as much cereal as they could in order not only to become self-sufficient, but also to be able to export, um, export food to Britain uh, under the policy of benevolent, uh, benevolent neutrality. Um, we hold very few paintings in our collection 
what I often think the top left document is a watercolor, an OPW watercolor of Clonus Post Office from the turn of the last century. A bottom left, you've got a lovely, a colorful postcard of a pristine Irish farmyard. It's the Kennedy Homestead in Duncanstown in New Ross. A, it was a commemorative card that was brought out to mark a JFK's visit to Ireland in 1963 in June, uh, when, of course, he visited a, his ancestral a place in, a, in New Ross and tragically was to die uh, in Dallas what, five months later. Um, the Irish Housewife Annual. Uh, again, we don't have too many magazines uh, in our collection, but I quite like this one um, because it gives, again, a somewhat idealised view of the Irish housewife in 1959. Uh, the way she has time to bake cake, she's got something on the stove there, and there's her husband smoking a pipe, and she looks as though she's separating two, uh, two fighting children. <laughs> so a multitasking woman there. Bottom right hand corner is a beautiful ordnance survey map of Galway, Galway City in the 1880s. And I'm going to show you an even nicer one of Kilkenny in a few minutes. Um, in relation to the services that we provide, uh, they're divided, it's quite a binary separation really between government and the public. So we are legally mandated to provide uh, guidance and advice to government departments and the courts relating to the management of their records. We manage the transfer of those records to the National Archives, as we mentioned, it used to be 30 years, now it would be 20. Um, assessing records uh, to determine whether they should be kept, whether they actually meet the criteria for long-term uh, protection and preservation as archives based on their informational and evidential value. And then to facilitate the disposal of those records. So low grade material, that's part of routine administration. It may be in duplicate or triplicate. That's not exactly a high flying policy. Or a, so that's the type of record really that generally would be disposed. Again, it's done according to very strict protocols within our regulations. In relation to our services to the public, the key word here really is to uh, remember the word free, free access to archives, free consultation with both the duty archivist or the genealogy, uh, the genealogy advisory service and free photography of, a, of material with your tablet or your phone subject to the permission of the, the duty archivist. So you all know this already, of course, being members of the KAS, but when it comes to starting your family and local research, well, it makes sense to collect as much as possible uh, as you can in advance before you come to visit us. So family names, of course, the parish or the townland can sometimes be almost, if not more important than the family name, because so many records uh, in Ireland, administrative records, are organized spatially. So the likes of the tie the plop and books, the primary valuation, the census, they're all organized on the basis of district electoral division, civil parishes, baronies, uh, townlands and so on. So knowing the parish or the townland name is, is critical. And of course the approximate time period. So, I have number one here in terms of the family and history, local history records, which, as I mentioned earlier, I suppose are the more obvious ones that most people are familiar with. So in terms of land and property occupancy, uh, the books of survey and distribution, the type of plot books, I'll be going into these separately in a sec. The valuation office and of course the census returns. Then in terms of buildings and the, the landscape, Ordnance Survey and Public Works, uh, their series of maps, plans and drawings dating from the early 19th century up until the early to mid 20th century. So taking a look at the books of survey and distribution, which span the indicative dates really are 1636 to 1703. Um, now, these were compiled to establish a reliable record of landowners in order to levy what was known as the quit rent, which was payment, basically a land tax, 
uh, money that was payable to the crown for the leasing of, of land uh, according to acreage. And the books of survey and distribution also incorporate information from earlier surveys, such as the, the Stratford, the Civil and the, the Downs surveys. The manuscript books are arranged by, Par by Barney and Parish, and they list the pre-1641 occupiers, so a pre-rebellion of 1641 occupiers on the left-hand page, who tended to be the old Irish or the Catholics the old Irish Catholics, the acreage of land held, and then the names of those to whom these lands were transferred, either as payment uh, or in lieu of payment to Cromwellian soldiers or after the restoration of Charles II in 1660. And they're on the right hand page. So you'll see it here. This is a book of survey and distribution for the parish of Ballygurin. So on the left hand side, you will have the old Irish Catholics listed and the, 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 the amount of acreage that they have, which would have been measured in acres, roods and perches. And then on the right hand side, you will have either the Cromwellian settlers who ended up then being superseded by the soldiers of King Charles II. So it gives you over the course of 50 or so years and a very interesting uh, pattern of land holding and how that changes, depending really on basically whose side you are on. Um, obviously on the side of, of Cromwell or on the side of uh, Charles II as a, as a royalist. Um, here we have the tithe plotment books. I've skipped forward almost two centuries. Um, a little bit like the, in a sense, a little bit like the uh, books of survey distribution. These were compiled to assess the amount payable by occupiers of agricultural holdings for the support of the Church of Ireland and its clergy. And I mentioned earlier about these books being arranged on a spatial or geographical basis. There's a manuscript book for almost every parish in the country. And they, gave, they give the names of the occupiers, the amount of land they held, and the sums to be paid in tithes. Now, of course, in 1820s, 1830s Ireland, um, even though the Church of Ireland was, of course, the established church, um, the majority of people at, the, at that time would still have been Catholic. So you can imagine how unpopular this tithe would have been felt by, a, by the Catholic tenants or lessees. Um, and what began as payment actually in terms of crops or a tithe of your harvest, one tenth of your harvest, um, became commuted to a financial payment. And then of course, a, things get a little bit more fraught as you go in to the 1830s when you have the tithe wars, which were waged or fought mainly in relation to opposition, very strong local opposition to paying the, the, the tithe for the upkeep of a church that many people weren't actually members of. Um, you can search on our website for free the tithe plotment books which have been scanned and I will give you a look at again what you might expect to see. The tithe plotment books for our book for Nicholas Murphy who lives in Liz Downey and you have on the left hand side there Liz Downey the names of the lessees or the tenants. Then you've got the breakdown of their holdings into the quality of the land. So you've got first class land. So that's going to be very fertile land, obviously very good for growing crops. You will have second class land, third, fourth, and it goes the whole way down to sixth class land, which I would imagine is probably going to be very swampy and boggy and not very good really for, for growing a whole lot. And then you've got ARP, uh, acres, roofs and perches. So the measurement of, of land and the amount that each of these tenants is paying and the tithe payable, the very end there, it's calculated for how much each is paying. So we've got a James Walsh who is paying six pounds, 12 shillings and 10 pence which would not have been an inconsiderable sum at that time. Moving on to the primary or Griffiths valuation uh, from 1847 to 1864. This again, 
along the lines of the, the tabs and the books of survey distribution. It's all about the calculation of land holding in order to assess tax. So it's a record of Ireland's first full property tax. It's a full scale published valuation of property that was undertaken by the valuation office under the management and operation of Sir Richard Griffith. So I'm sure many of you have looked at, at, at this already. Um, you've got the printed valuation showing the names of the occupiers of the land and the buildings, the, the names of the lessors, so the, the landlords or landladies, and the amount and the value of the property that was held. And here we have uh, just a snapshot here of um, the primary valuation of tenements in Callan. So you've got the in the townland of Tinamoon, a uh, within presumably the, the town of Callan or part of the town of Callan, you've got these people living in West Street. So you've got John O'Brien, John Kelly, Thomas Locke, Johanna Larkin, and so on. You've got the names of the immediate lessors, so uh, those who are the landowners. So James Corr and Patrick Hoban are the key appear to be the key land owners of property, certainly in West Street in Callum. You've got a description of the tenement. We're back to acres, roots and purchase again here. The net value of the land, the net value of the buildings and the total annual value. And then you've got the total worked out here in each of the columns. So again, it's a wonderful source to be able to trace land holding and the changing of pieces of land and property from maybe father to son, mother to daughter, family to family. And of course, these, the, these properties and these acreages get smaller and smaller um, as, as time goes by. And of course that has disastrous results when it comes to the famine with the subdivision of, of properties that just get smaller and smaller and more and more unsustainable for families to be able to subsist on what they are able to grow. But the valuation office books, uh, which are held in the National Archives, these in a sense are what you might call the building blocks of the primary valuation or Griffith's valuation. So these are compiled in connection with the primary valuation. So Griffith's is the end product, but the field, the house, the mill, the quarto, and the tenure books are the raw material for the primary valuation. And these are also available to search for free on our website. Now, don't be misguided by the census.nationalarchives.ie. That's just the way the URL worked for, um, for, a, for that particular collection. Um, and I mentioned to Nula earlier, actually, I can make a, a talk, my presentation available uh, for people if they want to take a look at so they can click in directly into these URLs or links. So I thought we would go with a Pat, Pat Nolan or a Patrick Nolan, a valuation office house book for Patrick Nolan, who lives in the barony of Goran. And he is the he is the occupier and he is renting or holding land from a Mrs. Margaret McCreary. And you've got the description of the, the, the tenement or the farm. And he has, he is paying what looks to be two pounds, six shillings, and I think maybe zero, zero pence. And that is, is here at Will 1820. Um, but it's probably dated, oh yeah, sorry, it's dated 1828 there, the 21st of July, 1828. So that gives you an idea of what a house book looks like and these are searchable by name and by geographical area on our dedicated genealogy website. Now the 19th century census returns, well we're probably all very familiar with, with these. We do know of course that most of them were tragically destroyed in 1922 and those which did survive you're literally talking about fragments, pieces, pages, of, of uh, material or of census returns. Now they don't have anything like the level of a comprehensiveness or detail as the 1901s or the 1911s have, but still they, st they still provided a snapshot of Ireland 
1821, in 1831, and so on. And so much of that was destroyed. Um, so literally, we have digitized the fragments or the remnants of what escaped the, the fire. The returns for 1861 and 71 were destroyed in 1877, and that was done deliberately. And then for 1881 and 19, 1891, these were deliberately pulped <clears throat> due to a paper shortage during World War One. So you really couldn't make this up. Um, I'd like to think that if we could go back in time and the uh, chief uh, census officer knew or could travel uh, forward in time and know what would happen, hopefully they would not have sanctioned the destruction of the 1861 to 91 records, because unfortunately from 61 to 91, the destruction was total. But 1901 and 1911, uh, the original manuscripts do survive for all 32 counties on the island. And similar to the other records mentioned, they are organized by district electoral division within each county, DED, Townlander Street. Um, and these were made available online first uh, in 2007, uh, when we uh, released those for Dublin, uh, then went on to Belfast and Kerry and could, proceeded to release them over, uh, over the, the, the succeeding years. Um, and I thought it would be nice to take a look at a former KS president um, and of course noted and celebrated Kilkenny historian, Margaret Phelan, who was born Daisy Duggan in December uh, 1902 in William Street. So if you can see there number five, line number five, you've got Daisy Duggan, who is the daughter. She's Catholic, she's eight. Um, she will turn nine in December of that year because this is taken on the 2nd of April. She's a scholar and she's single, well, thankfully. Um, and she was born in Kilkenny, in, um, living in William Street. And I think born in, in Butler House. Um, I often think it's quite nice to see small children down as scholars, even when they're only two or three. Um, my own grandmother was in, is in the census for 1911. She's barely a year old and she's down as a scholar or the way it was sometimes written as a scholar. So there you've got uh, Mrs. Phelan and, and her family. Uh, there are two servants and I know further down, I think they may have, they may have had a, a, a gardener. They had the two, two servants and they also have a niece living with them. So that is Mrs. Phelan's return for, for 1911. This was the Ordnance Survey town plan I said I would uh, allude to, which I think is nicer than the, um, <laughs> the, the Galway one, but of course I'm biased. So you see the River Nor uh, running through it like a, a bright blue, a, a, I suppose an S-shaped almost there. Um, if you look closely just south of the, the River Nor there, the blue band, you see the castle and you see the footprint of the castle and in front of it, you see the rose garden and the fountain. Now, I, you will be able to tell me, I've no doubt in the audience, whether the rose garden was laid by then, but it certainly looks as though it has been laid out as a garden there. And then of course, directly opposite the castle, you have got the stables and the stable yard and the outhouses, which now of course are the design center and the, artisan jewellers um, in, the, in the courtyard of, of um, the, the castle. So I thought I would move on now to the family and local history records part two, which relate or deal with perhaps more, maybe less usual or less well-known papers. Now I'm sure many of you already know these, but um, the outrage papers, the Irish crime records, the census reports, as opposed to the returns, and the finance compensation files. So the outrage papers, these are a subseries of the Chief Secretary's Office registered papers. They were known as the State of the Country papers from 1821 to 26, and then they're renamed the outrage papers from 1826 onwards until the end of the, of the 19th century. And they document crimes of a, of a political or an organized nature, by which I mean, we say local groups like, you know, white boys, ribbon men, 
Um, and here we have outrage reports, a selection of them for Kilkenny. And in the far left here, we see that there is a, a 100 pound rob reward rather for a robbery. A, whereas Arthur William Pym, pay clerk in the payment of the Board of Works, he was on his way to pay the labourers in the barony of Kells when he was set upon by an armed party and robbed of a considerable sum of money. And the commissioners of public works are offering a reward of £100. And that is in March 1847. Now, you can imagine March 1847. We are in the teeth of the famine. So the men or women or whoever who actually robbed William Arthur William Prim of £100 actually ended up stealing from, unfortunately, from the workers of the, those who were working on Office of Public Works projects, which were created and established during the famine um, to, to, to provide employment and um, a livelihood for people who were, um, who, who were hungry and, and obviously who needed to be paid in order to be able to feed their family. Um, you've got there the trade citizens and labourers of the Kilkenny United Repealers who are meeting on Monday evening next. And this is May 1848. To reiterate their resolve that Ireland shall have repeal. And we've got guest speakers, Thomas Francis Marr, C.G. Duffy, P.J. Smith, Esquires. And we see that this was printed on John's Bridge by William Doyle Printer. So they are going to meet to discuss repeal. And that is happening in May, uh, May 1848. Um, then we got a letter to His Excellency, the Lord Lieutenant, and that relates to the stationing of militia in Thomastown. And then on the right-hand side, the far right, is a letter from September 1848 in relation to the state of the potato crop. So three years, a full three years later, uh, from the appearance of the potato blight in September 1845, you're still getting reports of um, the condition of the potato harvest. Uh, and that is in, that is in Kilkenny. Um, the good, nice thing about the outrage papers is from 1835 to 52, the records are arranged by county and by year. So ordering them for this period, 35 to 52, is actually far more straightforward than having to consult the indexes to the Chief Secretary's Office registered papers, which for those of you who have lifted them and carried them can be quite an arduous and a frustrating experience. So from 1835 to 1852, it's actually much easier to call up the, the records of the, um, the, the, the outrage, uh, the outrage reports of the outrage records. The Irish crime records from 1848 to 93. These, a little bit like the printed valuation, these are a printed sub-series of the Chief Secretary's Office collection. And they record crime statistics on the basis of reports that were sent into the constabulary, sorry, sent to the constabulary office by local constabularies all around the country. They're arranged by province, by county, by year, by month, and they become more detailed as time goes on. So the information is scanty enough in 1848, but by the time you got to the early, uh, the early 1890s, it's far more detailed. Um, and it's an absolute treasure trove for the study of crime and for the study of the legal and penal systems in Ireland in, mid, in, in the mid to late 19th centuries. So to give you an idea here of what they look like, on the left hand side, we've got a return of outrages reported uh, for 1864 in the province of Leinster. So on this page, you've got Dublin, Kildare, Kilkenny, Kings. So it's being organized alphabetically. Then you've got the date of death and then you've got the particulars of homicides. So on the right hand side, I've got a little bit more detail here. This is it from within the province of Leinster, the county of Kilkenny. And we have got crimes that are committed in 1876. So I'm going to take a look at the bottom one here. It's September, 
the 2nd of September, 1876, you've got James Brett, who's a laborer, is murdered by his brother, John, and his first cousin, Walter. Uh, poor James was deaf and dumb. So the men approached using offensive language. Uh, the, he had a knife plunged into his left side, neck and right breast. So it contains very detailed information, not unlike what you would expect in a newspaper report or a crime report or a court report um, nowadays. Um, and Ellen Brett, their sister was present where she, her hands were cut in trying to save her brother. The brothers, John and James, who live next door to each other, had for a considerable period of time been on bad terms, resulting from John's desire to succeed to the whole of his father's lands. So unfortunately, there is nothing new here when it comes to arguments and bad blood over title to, to land. So John Brett absconded, but was subsequently arrested, as was his cousin. They were sentenced to 12 months imprisonment with hard labor and nine months imprisonment with hard labor. So given that he was murdered, they murdered him. It doesn't seem to be a particularly heavy, um, heavy sentence. Um, but for those of you who are more familiar with criminal reports from that time, maybe that was in keeping um, because we have another man here who's a collier who dies from injuries inflicted upon his spine. And it relates to a quarrel and wanton assault. Um, and this is a man who accidentally fell from a cart. He consulted a bone setter whose unskillful treatment caused inflammation of the arm and eventual death. So that would have been negligence, I think, nowadays. Um, and the accused was bailed for trial at the Spring Assizes. So these are full of information in relation to crimes or wrongful deaths on a county by, by county basis. Um, so here we've got now the census reports, not the returns, the reports. These consist of statistics based on the census returns from 1821 to 1911. So individual households can't be identified by name, but the reports record numbers, ages and gender by townland, civil parish and barony. And these are searchable for free on the census, uh, the, the CSO website, not on ours, but on the CSO website from the reports that go from 1821 to 2006. And because so much was lost of the 19th century census returns, these reports, OK, they're not going to ever fill the gap in terms of micro detail of individuals that the re destroyed returns would have. But they're still better than nothing. And they are very, very good for statistical st statistical comparisons. So here you got reports, the census reports for Gal for Callum and Galmoy in, in 1851. And what they do from decade to decade is they give you the decade beforehand, which enables very sound comparative analysis. So as you can imagine, there is quite a difference for uh, between 1841 and 1851 with the population in, of, of Ireland, particularly in the counties that were so heavily impacted by the famine so along the western seaboard in particular and in the southwest in Kerry and Cork so if you are interested in patterns of population the statistics that are printed and available in these census reports from each decade are really very very interesting and you can see here or if you can the population as I mentioned from 1841 to 51 it breaks down from parish to down to townland. Um, and again, you have got incredibly accurate, precise figures for population, for male to female, level of education, number of houses, quality of houses, the poor law valuation in 1851 and, and so on. And from 1871, the information gathered in the census reports increases dramatically. And tables of statistics relating to marital status, occupation, location of birth, disability, religious profession, and so on, starts to appear. 
And despite appearances to the contrary, the census reports are far more than just dry statistical tables because they describe the changing circumstances of each district in Ireland and provide contextual information for, for family and, and social history. And this is the final uh, series of uh, files that I'm going to look at through a prism of, of Kilkenny. And these are the Department of Finance Civil War Compensation files, which are held in the National Archives and were uh, transferred by the, uh, by the Department of Finance. There are three main series relating to before the truce, so up until July 1921, immediately post-truce, so during the, just after the end of the War of Independence, and covering the uh, the Civil War, and then a the the third third one there, which relates to it's almost like a mopping up exercise between 1916 and 1923. So that scoops up stray 1916 Easter Rising files, War of Independence. There's not many of either of those, but there is a lot in relation to the in relation to the Civil War. So what we call the FinComp 2s, the post-truce files, there are just under 20,000 files covering damage to property. And that's a key thing to remember or a difference to, to have in your mind. It's not injury to the person, although there are files in relation to injury to the person, but this is damage to property during the Civil War. And it was a compensation scheme that was operated by the state solicitor in cooperation with the Department of Finance and individual county courts. So throughout, though the years covered by the files run from 1920 to 41, the bulk of them really do date from 1922 up until the late 1920s and concentrate more or less on the Civil War. So this is just to give you an idea of what they looked like before we started to conserve them. So here they are being cleaned with a, so with a, a smoke sponge. As you can see, the covers have shipped, has shipped an awful lot of the dirt and the grime, which is being, uh, which is being rubbed away using a, a smoke sponge. Then we refoldered them in acid-free uh, folders. They would have been in acid or rather folders and boxes that were full of acid, which of course would have begun to attack the paper fibers and corrode them and cause them to become fragile and, um, and, and liable to, to, to tear or to, to crumble away. And then reboxing those acid-free folders into, into acid-free boxes. I'm showing you these photographs just to give you an idea also of the procedures and the processes and treatment that collections get within the National Archives, because of course we want to prolong their, their longevity for as long as we as we possibly can. So for Kilkenny. Between 1922 and 1939, those are the date spans of the finance compensation, the FinComp 2s, and Kilkenny is coded number 10. So, for example, the first county would be Carlow, so Carlow is one, um, and then Wicklow uh, will be, um, including all the towns, and the towns and the counties, I think Wicklow is about um, 32, it does not include the uh, counties of, of um, Northern Ireland. And there are 379 files, which is a goodly number. Cork is about 2,500, being, of course, a much larger county. But this is what they look like. So they've got a fairly standard appearance. You've got the cover page here. So compensation claims post truce. And this is a Mary Mackey in the county of Kilkenny. Then you've got the title page, which is the name and address of the applicant with the location and date of the incident. So Mary or Maria Mackey is from Granny in, in, in County Kilkenny. She's a spinster and she is talking about the event which occurred in March 19, uh, 1922. Now I can call up those documents um, uh, where I'll be able to actually uh, get a better handle on the, on the text once they're not embedded in the, in the slide. Um, but this is a list Then you've got the inner pages with the schedules. So basically a list of the goods that were propped, that were damaged or taken. 
and the amount that's claimed. So in this particular claim, there is a total of 117 pounds, eight shillings and zero pence. And it is for what was done to the house. Um, what was done to, in this case, actually it's a farm and damage is done to machinery and to the fabric of the buildings. Then the second schedule has further detail of the losses sustained. And this is quite an, uh, uh, an, 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 an interesting case, I suppose, uh, for all the wrong reasons. Um, a, a dead cat, a note is tied to the body of a dead cat. And it's saying convicted spy, beware. And they're warning that, uh, that the person, uh, if they go and basically squeal, a uh, to the to the local authorities, or if they're found giving any information to the uh, about the IRA, that there will be consequences. Um, and the, the the dead cat, unfortunately, that follows a pattern that you find in these files: a uh, shock and cruelty to animals, a uh, poisoning of puppies, um, maiming of of cattle, of cows, just this wanton destruction and viciousness, which is all too often a feature of civil war, unfortunately, which is a misnomer um, really in itself. But this is a good one. This is the claim from the Earl of Ossery, Marcus of Ormond, for damage that's done to Kilkenny Castle in 1923. It's a file that's substantial. And he claims £3,310, 12 shillings for losses sustained to the fabric of Kilkenny Castle. So you may be able to see there, there is furniture, paintings, tapestries, and other chattels. Um, there is estimated expense of employing, oh yes, two valuers to survey the damage. And here's a 16 page report on the assessment of damage done to Kilkenny Castle, which is done by WK Clear and Sons Builders and Contractors. So that's just the first page of the report. And this is dated May, 1922. And it is a, the address given is Ormond Road and it is damaged to Kilkenny Castle. So this is a wonderful file on a, the damage that is done to Kilkenny Castle to windows, mahogany, pine shutters, plate glass, as a result of the siege on May the 3rd and 4th, 1922. So they get in their claim pretty quickly uh, because the assessment is done within the same month. And this is a claim from Mrs. Viola Ty of Woodstock House in Ennesteeg in 1924. And the a Woodstock House itself was destroyed by fire in July 1922. Um, and this is a, an amusing file because um, the family put in a claim for goods and for books and for clothes that they claim were destroyed but were actually moved to the family, one of the family's houses in London. So I don't know whether somebody tips off the assessors or what, but it's just quite interesting that basically what's trying to, what's being committed here or trying to be committed is fraud, is insurance fraud. Uh, but the assessors are onto them and it is quite interesting to see how diplomatically they put it in the file. But this case consists of three very large files that are tied together with, with linen tape. So for those of you from the area, perhaps around Innistig, it makes for really interesting and actually quite amusing reading. Um, in terms of potential research topics, within the finance compensation files. You can see here, they cover pretty much everything. Military history, women's history, I mentioned animal cruelty, uh, material goods, what was being stolen, diet and food. It's very interesting the light that's cast on that. Um, I always thought that Kilkenny people were of a very sophisticated bunch. Uh, and I was proved right because some of the food that is taken and stolen uh, from trains uh, passing through Kilkenny, grapes and salmon, grapes, salmon, wine, not your average bread, bacon, sausages, eggs, the ingredients for a good Irish fry, but a uh, oftentimes brandy, brandy, wine, grapes and, uh, and salmon. 
a so we congratulate congratulate ourselves for impeccable tastes and uh, a gour, gourmand uh, gourmand habits and uh, and tastes. In, in terms of actually looking for these files on our website, the details of each file was extrapolated and put into a database, which was uploaded onto our website using keywords. Um, what the, the files themselves, as you will have seen there, they don't look terribly exciting, but it's what's in them makes them such a rich source of information for civil war and for local, local historians. And they really, their potential hasn't been exploited or mined properly. Um, they are very, very good for inter-county comparison. So what was happening in Carlow? What was happening in Kilkenny? Was there a higher rate of theft of bicycles, for example? Was there a lower rate of attacks? Um, because although these are not relating to attacks on the person, they're attacks on property. I have come across files uh, in relation to attacks on property and the human toll that was taken. Uh, in one case, a couple were uh, a couple were tied up, and such was the trauma and stress that was caused to them as a result of the attack on their house that one of them died the next day. Um, so it's not all about damage to property. The, these records have a very, um, oftentimes quite a poignant um, and tragic angle and human consequence for for what might be on the face of it a very straightforward looking uh, attack because it can be the destruction of people's livelihoods whether it's a business that's destroyed whether it's animals that are attacked or maimed on a farm as part of of sabotage or or downright um cruelty um, and and viciousness and of course we do know that that happened between families and between friends um, but as I said, this is just a sample of the angles of history that these collections and that these files cover. And certainly of the 329 or so files relating to Kilkenny, um, you would have research to last you the, the end of your days. Uh, there is no, no doubt in my mind about that. So before the questions start, I would just like to say, Gurvi Mila Mahagov, for listening to me and now um it's question time <laughs> 